For today's video, I've come out to Arizona where apparently I have brought the rain along with me to drive the all new Hyundai Ioniq 6. For 2023, this isn't just the most efficient EV available in North America, tied with the Lucid Air, it's also one of the longest range. You'll be able to get 361 miles of range in the rear wheel drive Ioniq 6, and still over 300 miles of range if you opt for the 320 horsepower dual motor version. Let's take a look. The styling of the Ionic 6 is drastically different than the Ionic 5. The roof line is certainly lower, it's less boxy, and this front end is very, very low in fact. You'll really notice that when you take a look at the leading edge of this bumper, it's only about maybe 20 inches off the ground. That's because this is all about aerodynamics. This has one of the slipperiest drag coefficients for a sedan in North America at 0.22. Some of the worldwide versions of this will get digital rear view mirrors and they'll drop that even further. That's how that gets to this incredibly long highway range. Up front we have multi-module headlights. These are projector LEDs and then below that we have these sort of pixel themed accent lights. They're a little bit difficult to catch on camera but they don't blink in person. Don't worry about that. The pixel theme continues all around the Ionic lineup. We even find little pixel dots right down there at the bottom of the front bumper. This houses the radar sensor for the adaptive cruise control system and then these vents on either side open and close dynamically based on the cooling needs of the vehicle. It's a really nice touch that they're on the outside rather than hidden away. It also helps improve the aerodynamics. If at any point in this video you hear what sounds like static, I apologize. It's actually just the rain hitting my raincoat, not actual static on the mics. Now, in terms of length, this is about 191 inches long, so not far off the average American mid-size sedan. And that makes it fairly different than the other two electric sedans that it's a direct competitor against, the Polestar 2 and the Tesla Model 3. The Polestar 2 is considerably shorter than this, the Model 3 is still an important few inches shorter than this, with a shorter wheelbase, less legroom, but a bigger trunk in the back. And this does indeed have a trunk. If I press this button here, you'll notice it's not a lift back. And I do think that's the one missed opportunity for the Ionic 6 was to not give this a lift back design that maybe would be a bit more practical because the form of the vehicle does give me a bit of a lift back vibe. Let me know what you think of the look here. This drastic arc dropping down there to the rear and this cut line from the roof going down gives me a lot of Mercedes-Benz CLS vibes. If you're interested in range, you're going to want to pay close attention to the tire size on your Ionic 6. The upper end trims are going to have P0 all season 245 with tires. I'm surprised by that choice for two reasons. These are 10 millimeters narrower than the ones that we find in the top line Ionic 5 and EV6, which share this EV platform, but it's a grippier tire, a Pirelli P0 all season tire, not a summer tire, of course. Now, if you want the longest range, you're going to want the 18 inch wheel and tire package, which drops these down to 225 width. And that's the big reason that you're going to get an extra 60 miles approximately out of that model. Just know, of course, that you're not going to get the really cool design that we see in these wheels. Now for the controversial angle. This definitely has a very dramatic design to it, culminating in this whale tail like spoiler. It's actually a multiple spoiler setup because we have this big one on top, a little one down here, and then the bumper projects a little bit further from that. According to Hyundai, it's all about aerodynamics and smoothing the air out as much as possible as it passes across the vehicle surfaces to give this that maximum range possible. They did say that they admit it does have some resemblance to some German products, <coughs> Porsche, um, but obviously it's here for one reason, and that's all about the aerodynamic profile. Be sure and let me know what you think of the design of the EV6 in the comment section. This is the main light bar on the rear, then we have the third brake light in the middle. These lower sections are not functional, at least not in North America, they're simply reflectors. Other than the wheels and tires, the only other round element on the vehicle is the charge door right back here on the rear passenger side. It is a powered charge door, which is kind of a nice touch. Under the low slung hood, we do find a storage area, although it is relatively small. It no longer has a lid like you find in the Ionic 5 in order to help the front end drop a little bit further down. There are going to be three different power levels of Ionic 6 and two different battery packs to start with. The base model for $41,600 will give you 149 horsepower, rear wheel drive, the smaller battery pack, and 240 miles of range. If you want the biggest range topping model, then you're going to want to step up to $45,500 for the base trim with the extended range battery pack that will give you an upgraded rear electric motor, 225 horsepower, 
361 miles of range. It's actually a little bit more than Hyundai had estimated originally. If you want all wheel drive, and I'd say you probably do, then you're talking $49,000 minimum for the 320 horsepower dual motor model. It uses the same electric motor in the back and a smaller motor right here under the small front trunk. That's gonna give you a total of 316 miles of range in the lower end trims. If you opt for the SEL or limited trims, that's gonna drop down to 270 miles of range. And it is worth noting that if you get all wheel drive in the SEL and limited trims, it's gonna drop from 316 down to 305, mainly because of the tires and some of the added weight that we find in the upper level trims. Charging is where the Ionic 6 has a real advantage over its direct competition. Back here we find that CCS charge connector, and if you find the right CCS station, you can take this battery from 10% to 80% in just 18 minutes. And yes, it will indeed do that. I've done that all the time on our long-term EV6, which uses the same battery and same charging technology. What's more impressive though than the 10% to 80% charge time is the zero to 100% charge time, which really stretches out for most EVs. If you take a look at say, a Mustang Mach-E or a Tesla Model 3, it can take nearly an hour to go from 0% to 100% even on a fast charge station. This will take just 45 minutes to do that same thing. So 18 minutes, 10 to set, 10 to 80%, just about 45 minutes or so, zero to 100. If you're charging at home, there's an onboard 11 kilowatt level two charger, which can charge this battery completely full in about seven hours. The reality of course, is that the other advantage to a highly efficient EV like this or the Tesla Model 3, which definitely include the Model 3 in this, is that you may or may not need a high output EVSC to live with your vehicle because high efficiency means less consumption during the day. It means that your commute is not gonna take as many hours on the charger to get back to full. Below the rear bench seat, we find the same power outlet we find in the Ionic 5 and the same 1.9 kilowatt onboard inverter. This allows you to power things like refrigerators, microwaves, etc., and the vehicle will keep powering them until you reach a particular low battery cutoff that's adjustable in the infotainment system. This works not just with the connector back here, but also the vehicle to load connector that you can plug in the J1772 port. After a day of mixed driving, I found the front seats to be pretty comfortable. In this top end trim, they're also nicely adjustable with the passenger seat also getting a multi-way adjustable uh, seat cushion. We have a manual tilt telescopic steering column with basically the same range of motion as the Ionic 5. And these seats remind me a lot of the Ionic 5, but that could be good or bad. If you find the Ionic 5 seats comfortable, you're gonna like these. If you wish they had a little bit more lateral bolstering like I do, then you might want something else. I do think that the EV6 actually has a little bit more grip. Rear seat accommodations are definitely the big reason to get this over a Polestar 2. As you can see, I have tons of legroom back here, and the driver's seat is a little bit more reclined than I would normally sit in because I just could. Moving over to the middle, we have lots of width back here. This definitely feels wider than a Hyundai Elantra, but maybe not quite as wide as a Sonata. One definite difference between this and maybe a Model 3 is the amount of rear seat headroom that we get here in this center seat position. My head is definitely touching the ceiling. If I move to the outboard seat position, the seat bottom cushion is a lot lower to the ground. Here, I could put my head to the headrest there, but my head is definitely touching the ceiling. You'll find about three quarters of an inch more headroom in the Model 3, and for me, that's enough to make it a bit more comfortable. But we get a lot less leg room in the Model 3. So if you're, for instance, a family with young children and you're worried about rear-facing child seats in a Model 3, know that you have considerably more room in here. That's thanks to the longer wheelbase. As you'd expect in a dedicated EV platform, we have a completely flat floor, USB-C charge ports, and air vents back here in the rear. When it comes to cargo capacity, the 6 falls behind the 5, mainly because this is not a hatchback, it's a sedan instead. And it certainly has more of a slot-style trunk right back here. Now, Hyundai had some competitive comparisons earlier in the day. They put this below the Polestar 2 and the Model 3. It's definitely below the Model 3 that has a very large and deep trunk as well. But honestly, it feels very similar to the Polestar 2. The Polestar 2's cargo area is not terribly large. Now, one big thing to know is that even though we do have that tiny front trunk up front, it's certainly not that big, and it is certainly smaller than the one that we find in the Model 3. However, if you have a first generation or early build Model 3, you should know that your front trunk is bigger than the one in the current Model 3, because now the Model 3 has a heat pump, and that means that a 22 inch roller bag like this will no longer fit in its front trunk, but it still has one that is much bigger than we find here. As we look around the interior, keep in mind this is the limited trim, so obviously there are gonna be things in here that you won't find in the base trim. For instance, 
this regular sized moonroof just over the driver and front passengers heads. It's essentially only in the top trim Ionic 6, but if you want a sunroof that opens and closes, this is one of the few EVs in this segment that will offer that. You won't find one in the Model 3. You also won't find one in the Polestar 2. We have height adjustable shoulder belts for the driver and front passenger, and these very eccentric headrests, very similar design to what we see in other Hyundai and Kia models. These look like they should be four-way adjustable, but they are in fact just height adjustable. On the seat back cushion, we find piping that goes from orange to blue. That's kind of a cool touch in this trim. These seats are both heated and ventilated, so we find perforations on the seat back cushion and seat bottom cushion. I do wish that the bolstering was perhaps adjustable or a little bit more aggressive in this model. As you move on over to the front doors, you'll see the two-tone theme that we find in the rest of this interior with that almost ivory color in the middle and then sort of a soft gray above that. This is the lightest interior combination available, and it really shows off the ambient lighting system. This is now a two-zone ambient lighting system, so different color upper and lower. You can't do that in the Ionic 5. What's going on on the doors is that this is a hard plastic injection molded section up top with these ridges injection molded into it, and then they catch the ambient light strip that's right behind that armrest and arm grab. That's what's going on. We have a pretty decently sized storage area running the entire length of that door, although it does get wider up front. Moving over to the dashboard, we find the same sort of wing-like motif that you find in the Ionic 6 in other world markets, but here in the US, it's blank because we don't get the digital side view mirror. In other countries, that would be an LCD, and then there'd be a camera on the outside. That's not legal in the US, so we don't have one. We find another ambient lighting strip running right there across the dashboard. A large combination bin and slot style glove compartment. I had no problem fitting an 11-inch tablet computer inside. In the middle of everything, we find the same two-zone automatic climate controls we find in the Ionic 5. Touch buttons for the climate control, physical buttons for the infotainment system that's just above it. This large 12.3-inch infotainment system features Apple CarPlay and Android Auto full screen, but not wireless, which may upset some folks, although doesn't affect me because I prefer to plug myself in. A significant change in the Ionic 6 that we're going to see in other eGMP vehicles over time is that this software is now fully over there updatable, and it will over there update vehicle modules as well, not just the infotainment software. There's also something else. If we go in here, you'll notice we now have a battery conditioning mode. This will heat and cool the battery like it did before, but now if there's a navigation destination featuring a DC fast charging station, it will automatically heat the battery for even faster charging conditions at that stop. That's something that we didn't have before. Instead, we just had winter mode, and winter mode would keep the battery warm, but not quite as warm as you might need for peak DC fast charging. So sometimes you got those peak speeds, sometimes you had to precondition manually, I guess you could say. Down here we have utility mode. When this is engaged, you can power things like uh, accessories, microwaves, refrigerators, things like that from the vehicle to load connector or the connector on board the vehicle. You can then adjust things like the smart regeneration system, charging prompts, plug and charge, things like that. This does support plug and charge. Moving over to the center console, we have a Qi wireless charging mat, a single USB input there, two large cup holders, the buttons for the window switches, door unlock and lock, auto brake hold, etc. A small storage area there you can drop things like your key into. And then we have the center console storage area with two USB-C ports, decent amount of storage area, and a padded top. But the big difference between this and the Ionic 5 is the storage area down underneath that center console. It's definitely larger. That's because we don't have the powered console that we find in the Ionic 5. Instead, this is a stationary console, and that gives us a much more practical storage area down there. There's a 12-volt power port, lots and lots of area for bags and things like that there, and it also means that the USB port has been put in a more sensible location right up here on top. Now, while we're here, we should talk about the key because I am not the biggest fan of this key design. It's supposed to look like a Hyundai logo there, but it comes across as maybe a little bit too egg-shaped for my taste. So let me know what you think about that there. We have some additional buttons on the side because this has the smart park system, so you can go forward and backward in the parking space, press that one to open and close the trunk lid. But uh, what do you think about the front of this key? Now, if you're not the biggest fan of the key, you should know that this supports phone as key, so you don't actually need the key if you don't want it. The LCD instrument cluster has adjustable themes. They can be linked or unlinked to the drive mode. This is the favorite one in my EV6. It's basically the same look, and you find trip computer and other information right there in the middle. We find basically the same steering wheel and shifter that we find in the Ionic 5, with a little bit of a tweak here and there. So the shifter is down here on a separate stock from the windshield wiper stock above it. You rotate this end around for drive and reverse, and then park is that button right there. The steering wheel is similar, but you'll notice we have illuminated dots right here 
here in the middle. At the moment, these function basically as voice command recognition dots, but they may be used for other things in the future. On the back of the steering wheel, we have one of the things I love about Hyundai EVs, which are these adjustable regen braking paddles. You can adjust the regen between four different levels. You get a full one pedal drive mode, absolutely no regen braking, or an automatic mode as well, where it will adapt things based on the radar sensor up front, and then a bunch of different modes in between. Over here, we have the controls for the adaptive cruise control system, the drive mode toggle down there. That's a button, not a knob, even though it kind of looks like one. And then over here, we have some infotainment buttons. With no buttons or switches on the front doors, they move the mirror controls over here to the left of the steering column. It's also the button for folding the rear view mirrors. Over here, we have the power trunk button, a button to open and close the charge door, the dimmer control, parking brake, things like that. All right, it's time to get the Ionic 6 out on the road, and I have my friend Sofian from Redline Reviews over here with me. Uh, out on the road, it feels a lot like the Ionic 5, really. I mean, yeah, it, it has the same power, 320 horsepower, 446 pound-feet torque, and even though it's wet outside, it has all that traction, so yeah, that's the beauty about an EV. It feels very much like it regardless of the mode that we're in, eco mode. It's just going to be 225 horsepower in the rear, but if you have slip in the rear, it will suddenly engage the front axle, so you don't have to worry about that feature too much. Um, you know, it does feel a little bit firmer than the Ionic 5. Hyundai um, says that this was targeted at someone that wants something a little bit more dynamic. Yes. So yeah. if, I, if I turn off the steering, let's see how this feels here. <laughs> you know, there's, I, I think there might be maybe just a hair less body roll okay. than the Ionic 5, maybe? It's, it's kind of hard to tell, but uh, it definitely feels nimbler than the, yeah. the 5. Because that's the one thing about the 5 when we first drove it. It felt just big and soft. Mm -hmm. Like, because it didn't look like yeah. an SUV, but it certainly drove like one when you were driving it. I'd say it's kind of shades of gray. You mm -hmm. know, this this is definitely firmer than the Ionic 5 and the EV6. Those are kind of comfy mm -hmm. tuned, um, but this is not as firm as a Mach-E or a Model 3 Correct. or a Polestar 2. Yeah, the, the ride quality is the one thing that you mentioned earlier, like in the video, it's just kind of like, it, it, it feels firm, but it's not harsh. Mm -hmm. And I think even, even this model with the 20 inch wheels, it has really good ride quality. Now, according to Hyundai, Polestar 2 and Model 3 are like the main competitors. Mm -hmm. What do you think as far as the, that feel goes? Well, I mean, the Model 3 is the one to beat. I mean, Tesla mm -hmm. does almost a quarter million last year that they sold that it's their best selling model. It's the best selling EV in the world. I think yeah. they just surpassed yeah. 1 million units. So don't question the benchmark. Right. So. I mean, the Polestar 2, I was always kind of slightly disappointed in for some reason, although they, they did just introduce a really, really refreshed one. I think this car kind of feels right in the middle between the two yeah. vehicles, to be honest. It, it, it does in some ways, yeah. Yeah, the, the feel of the car, I love the way the infotainment is laid out. I like the seating position. Uh, and the visibility actually is not that bad as well. I'm surprised. I was surprised by it. I'd expected that rear style, that really teardrop rear end to really compromise visibility. Mm -hmm. Honestly, it's really quite like a Sonata or an Elantra. It's right in line with that visibility wise. Yeah, I mean, it, it's so good that I guess you don't really need the digital camera rear view mirror, which I mm -hmm. think I complained about in my video. But I mean, overall, I'm just noticing now that I wish the seats were more aggressively bolstered. <laughs> I do wish it had inflatable bolsters. I think that would have gone with the sportier personality. Mm -hmm. These do feel a little bit less bolstered than what we see in the EV6. And of course, okay. this is the you know, same platform as GV60, EV6, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They all use the same electric motors and battery setup. Right. Um, and that is definitely an advantage for this is that the battery is smaller than a lot of the competition. Definitely is a uh, smaller battery and lighter curb weight than something like a Mach-E. Correct, yeah, this one that we're driving is around 4,600 pounds, which um, is about average, I'd say, although the Tesla is the featherweight. Yeah, that Tesla's weighs, really light. Yeah, I don't know how Tesla gets their cars to be that yeah. light, but... Uh, although, as we were talking about earlier, we did notice that a lot of those curb weight specs for the Model 3 were like the first generation builds mm -hmm. with the batteries, and the battery has gotten bigger now, and we don't have new curb weight specs. Correct, yeah, because yeah. now Tesla uses an 82 kilowatt hour, mm -hmm. which technically the Tesla, the Polestar, and the BMW i4 all have bigger batteries than this, but this car gets the same, if not better, range. Yeah, 360 miles of EV range, and we've been driving it pretty hard, and we've also been going up in altitude. We've averaged 2.8 miles per kilowatt hour, which mm -hmm. seems pretty decent. That's, that's strong, to yeah. be honest. Yeah, 83% state of charge. The gasometer says 265, but you know, it's that's really just a gasometer. We don't mm -hmm. we don't know what that really translates out to, but right. definitely seems pretty healthy. Mm -hmm. And in my own EV6 uh, GT line long-term all-wheel drive that we have now, mm -hmm. uh, we've been averaging you know maybe 280 miles or so, 290 miles if we really treat it gently on long distance road trips. Mm -hmm. So it seems believable that this could push that boundary with the greater efficiency out on the highway. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I love how Hyundai is like using this platform and just making the car feel so different mm -hmm. and also getting the better efficiency you want, but it's like the price of this vehicle is the same as the five. Yeah, so you really just get that quest, how much do you want the cargo area in the back and the box? Right, and that's the one thing is the cargo space in this vehicle isn't great. I yeah. think they said like 11 2.2 cubic feet. That is definitely on the small side. Mm -hmm. And compared to like even the Model 3, which is also sedan, it has that has more. The Polestar and the BMW is also a liftback, which yeah. does have more. Yeah, that's definitely true. But this is a lot less expensive than the uh, the BMW. Mm -hmm. I was surprised that the Polestar was included in that that comparison because the Polestar 2 is fairly expensive. They're they're mm -hmm. trying to go after this different audience, and then the new Polestar 2, which just got new electric motors and some battery changes, mm -hmm. it's now rear wheel drive instead of front wheel drive right. by default. Um, got a little bit of extra range, and now there's an even more powerful version <laughs> uh, with even firmer suspension. The ride quality on that is kind of um, it's very you know, BMW M model. Right, right. So here's a question, Alex. What do you think of the uh, fake sound this thing is making? I hate it. I turn the <laughs> fake sound off in every EV that I'm in, and I'm glad that you can turn it off. Yes. Uh, you can adjust it high, low, etc. This is the moderate setting that I have it on yes. right now. Yes, and it's, it's not as weird as the Hummer sound, yep. but it's not really my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. What is my cup of tea, though, are these regenerative brake paddles on the back. I love the way that Hyundai deals with regenerative braking. Mm. If you want one pedal drive, you can do that. If you want sailing where there's no regeneration, you can do that as well. Mm. And they, they switch between those modes very easily. There's also the adaptive mode. If I hold this down, I can then get an adaptive mode where it's going to use the radar sensor in the car to automatically adjust that throttle lift off regen. Yeah, which is something that I, the last time I saw something like that was in the um, the Mercedes EQS. Yeah, so that's it's really basically cool. Hyundai Kia and Mercedes that, that do this one. Um, I think that's that's a really handy feature. So if you want that feel of aggressive uh, assistance out on the highway, so you can do that one pedal thing out in stop and go traffic, but mm -hmm. when you're out on a road like this, if you want to be more of a sailing kind of thing, you can have both. And then of course you put in your foot on the brake and you get blended braking. Mm -hmm. Now back on the subject of efficiency for just a moment here, the obvious advantage to a smaller battery like this and high efficiency not only is that you can go further on a road trip, but those charging speeds that we talked about earlier, those are really going to be advantageous here. The smaller battery is the big reason why this will go 360 miles in a charge and only take 18 minutes to recover 70% of that, mm -hmm. or just about 45 minutes if you want to completely go from zero to absolutely 100%. And it's worth noting that like a 300 mile range Mach-E, which I'm actually surprised wasn't on their competitive list, to be honest, the Mach-E. Although I guess that one more compares with the five. I, I guess so, yeah. but it's kind of that, is, this a, is it a sedan? Is what is? The, I don't know what the Mach-E is. You yep. can call it whatever you want. But, um, but something like that, it takes 45 minutes in the big battery, faster charging one, just to go 10% to 80%. Right. So you need a lot more range out of this than that 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 charging window. Right, and remember the Mach-E also has like a 98 kilowatt hour battery yeah. pack, so significantly larger. And it really just mm -hmm. speaks the efficiency and how fast this, this platform actually does charge. Yeah, and so if you're the kind of person that maybe wants to survive at home with maybe a slow level two charger, maybe your electrical infrastructure home can only support a, a 20 amp or a 25 amp charger, you could probably have zero issues daily driving this and even weekend longer tripping it mm. with a relatively slow level two EVSC because the battery is smaller and you just, you just don't need that much energy. Right. Definitely some advantages there. Now, obviously when it comes to the performance numbers, this is gonna be substantially similar to the Ionic 5 and the EV6 with the same motor setup. In our quick zero to 60 test out here in Arizona, we ended up with what, uh, 4.7, 4.8, something like that? 4.75 seconds. 4.75, and there are two of us in the car, luggage in the back, etc. cetera. Uh, it's been raining out here, so maybe there was a little bit of a traction uh, disadvantage for the vehicle, but right in line with that, if you want to go faster zero to 60, you will go faster in the Polestar 2 or the Tesla Model 3, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and that is worth noting that the performance version of the Tesla Model 3 price-wise is not far off of this. It's actually a bargain. It's 54 yeah. grand, for which, really is, fast zero to 60 <laughs> which is like 3.2 for that car yeah. for $54,000 because the one we're driving here is 57 yeah. and no tax credit. And this, But this is a little bit bigger, so it's like, mm -hmm. do you want the backseat room? Do you want the, the feeling of the bigger car, the presence of the bigger car? Right. Or do you want that, that fast zero to 60 time? It's definitely gonna be a consideration for a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. If you wanna get your hands on the new Ionic 6, these should be on dealer lots right around the time that you're watching this video, but there are a few things to know. The first one is it's built in South Korea, so it's not gonna qualify for the full federal tax credit at this point in time. 
Whether or not it will qualify for that will depend on whether or not Hyundai decides to move production to the United States. That is possible though, because the GV70 electric is being built in the US, as is the new Kia EV9, and rumor mill says upcoming Hyundai and Kia EVs are gonna be built in the US as well. So whether or not they move existing production of Ionic 5 and 6 to the US remains to be seen. But at this point in time, no federal tax credit on purchases. We're waiting for some details from Hyundai Financial as to whether leases will get the federal tax credit. That's entirely possible. Minimum point of entry, $41,600. That's gonna get you 149 horsepower, 240 miles of electric range. If you want the 361 mile range model, that's gonna be 45.5. If you want all wheel drive, minimum point of entry, $49,000. This trim here, as equipped, fully loaded essentially, just under $58,000 including destination. So the pricing range is fairly narrow and definitely lower than what we see in its direct competitor from Sweden slash China, which would be the Polestar 2. The Polestar 2 is also considerably smaller. The back seat is definitely very, very tight in that Polestar 2. The Model 3 is a little bit bigger, but it's still smaller on the inside than this is. If you want extra room, you wanna take a look at a Tesla Model Y, which is of course gonna be more expensive than this model. Now, your tax situation is gonna depend on whether or not that Model Y could be cheaper for you, it is built in the United States, but another thing to keep in mind is that we are currently waiting for Treasury guidance on how the tax credit is gonna go forward starting around April of the 2023 calendar year. That's when the battery manufacturing and sourcing requirements come into effect, and most likely, although we don't have any information on this just yet, but most likely the Model 3 will lose about half of its tax credit, and that's gonna help balance things out on the Ionic 6. Basically, you're gonna want the Ionic 6 if you want the rear seat accommodations, you want this particular sexy profile, which I think is certainly more style forward than we find in the Model 3. The Model 3 comes across as a little bit boring, and there are hundreds of thousands of them sold in North America now, so it's definitely a common sighting. This is gonna be an awful lot more unique out on the road. Whether that's good for you or not, I will leave that up to you. Also, whether you would get this over an EV6 or an Ionic 5, which are very closely related and have many of the same advantages and disadvantages as this electrically, that remains to be seen as well. I think I would probably get the Ionic 5. I like the boxier, pragmatic shape that we have going on in the back. It's gonna charge just as fast as this, but it's not gonna go as far on a battery. It's certainly not gonna do 360 miles. Be sure and hit that subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen because hopefully we will have one of these at home soon so we can do a full range test and complete evaluation on the model. In the meantime, find us over at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all those other social places, and hopefully you are all staying dry out there. See all of you next week.